My name is Anna Gold, and I used to be on a tremor when I first started this school. I moved up here when my daughter was a year old, so that would be 1976, and I had been teaching in Berkeley, um, fifth and sixth grade, and um, it was this very wonderful school and that we it was a, associated with the University of California, and so we got to experiment and tried lots of different things. And I was always interested in incorporating the arts in any of the academics I was teaching. So I did a lot of music and theater and dance and that kind of thing. Um, when we moved up here, I started subbing in the school, and I couldn't find any schools where I would want to send my daughter. And this was, my, you know, there were no alternatives to the, just the regular public school. That's all you could do. And you couldn't legally keep your kid at home either. So I started a nursery school first. We called it the, with a friend, Janet Gettler, and we called it the children's school. And it was over by SBD. We rented a space and we started with, you know, two and a half year olds up to age four preschool. And I had a couple of other people teaching there as well. And it was just lots of fun. And when it came time for the children to graduate from that program, the parents were saying to me, but what are we gonna do now? Yeah. You know, we love this, this nursery school with all the, the costumes and the scarves and the singing and the dancing and the drama for these little children. But when we look at the public schools here, it, it, they seem rather dead compared. So I said, well, I'd, I'd be happy to explore that, but I don't know what kind of school is right uh, for this time and this place. And so my husband at that time, his name was Blair Tremoreau, he said when he was in Europe, he had heard about the Waldorf schools. And they were th throughout the, Ger Germany especially, but in a lot of the countries there, the curriculum incorporated the arts. And he said, you really ought to look into that because that really feels like it's the kind of school you're looking for. So I'd never heard of Waldorf education. Um, no one up here had ever heard of Waldorf right. education. All they knew about Waldorf was a salad, mm -hmm. you know, with, with, with apples and, and um, what is it, walnuts. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a Waldorf. So I found out that there was a center in, in Sacramento, in Fair Oaks, where they taught um, a foundation year, and then they, they taught teachers to teach in that style. Um, before going there, I actually went to a few lectures that a man named Rene Carrito, who was in charge of the school at the time, it wasn't called Steiner College, it was just, it was just a school, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so he gave a couple of lectures which were really inspiring, where he talked about a curriculum that not only incorporated the arts and a lot of imagination, but it was really keyed to the development of the, of the child. And it was um, the curriculum basically recapitulated the whole history of human civilization, starting out with very imaginative stories, um, which were told by, you know, for eons have been told at the fireside. It's natural for people to pass on information through stories. That's what we do. And also, as, as a developing civilization, we all sang together as tribes and we danced together. This is what humans do. They express the inner, their inner core. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where really knowledge rests is inside and it's, it's ignited by storytellers and all the arts. And that just felt so right to me. Mm -hmm. So I uh, dilly-dallied around. I thought, do I, wait, how can I go to that? I have a little three-year-old daughter. Um, how can I get that foundation and learn more about it? So I decided to hire a, a babysitter for the whole, um, during the day. And I left at 7.30 every morning for an 8.30 class. And I spent a year taking the foundation, hmm. the Waldorf training foundation year. And what I found out is that uh, Rudolf Steiner was an incredibly intuitive, wonderful 
Renaissance thinker, and this would have been the turn of the uh, 20th century, so it was, you know, 1910, 1915. Um, he himself had been raised in a very strict Catholic setting, all, you know, boys, with rows, seats with rows, and you'd have a teacher with a, uh, standing with a podium in front, and you'd, it was all rote, rote. You know, you, you learned like that, and it was very staid. At one point, someone knew he was exploring, working with children, um, and this person worked as, uh, it was the director of a, the Waldorf cigarette factory in, uh, I've forgotten what town it was, but he had asked uh, Rudolf Steiner if he would start a school there for the workers' children. So that's, so it was called the Waldorf School because it was associated with the um, Waldorf factory. <laughs> and he got to teach people that were renowned in their fields. So he'd have an artist come and work. He'd have a historian that he knew. He knew a lot of people in the, in the community. And he'd have them come and teach. And they were very enthusiastic. The children were enthusiastic. And it became this whole movement that people loved. And then parents started getting involved. I mean, it was a whole breakthrough in terms of education. It just exploded the, the traditional rote, you know, teachers at the head with all the knowledge, and you have to just ingest it. Mm -hmm. I found out the first year, basically, about Rudolf Steiner's work. The other thing I realized, though, is that he didn't have a corner on working with children with the, through the arts, mm -hmm. that a lot of really good teachers, even in public school, incorporated the arts. And, and I'd always tried to do it too. And what was hard was to see how the people who were in, in, the, in the program took Rudolf Steiner as gospel. Mm -hmm. And they weren't thinking for themselves. A lot of that was just, if Rudolf Steiner said, we paint the kindergarten wall this shade of pink, we're going to paint it that shade of pink. And they didn't really think it out and, and trust their own intuition. And these people heard about these kind of schools in Germany, and they, they started spreading through Germany. Um, and then they came to New York in 1925. The first Waldorf school was in New York City in 1925. And my daughter actually ended up teaching there for, after she you know, graduated from college. She taught, and I thought that was so wonderful that she got to be in the very first school. And it, was, it went from K, now it's K through high school, mm -hmm. and with a nursery school too. So it's really <clears throat> still there and still thriving. So be this is before I decided to go. Um, I was trying to see if I could somehow manage it. And finally, one day in October already, after the program had started in September, I woke up and sat in bed, and, and this voice came in and said, do it. And I, what? Do it right now. So I got up, you know, uh, got dressed, and I picked up the phone, and there was Rene Carrito, not the secretary, but the head of the whole thing. And I told him that I was really felt that this might be the kind of school we needed up here in Nevada County, and I was interested in exploring it and interested in perhaps coming uh, I'm being part of that program, but I know it's late in the uh -huh. year. And he said, oh, no, don't worry. Just come on. We'd love to have you. He was just so welcoming. So I started. And that's, you know, but that was that inner voice that said, just do it, your intuition. Mm -hmm. And that's what I encourage everybody to follow that voice. Mm -hmm. All the teachers, you know, it's, it's because it's naturally human to want to incorporate all of the arts. Mm -hmm. It's just the most natural thing in the world and not to be stuck on any kind of dogma. Mm -hmm. So rediscovering Waldorf education for yourself is what I um, encourage any teacher to do because it's, yeah, rediscovering it. So while I was in that foundation year, I met a woman named Krista Horner who was going to be moving to Nevada City with her five children. <laughs> and they spanned the ages of like three to 10. I mean, they were, or maybe it was four children, four children. Um, but they were a big, 
Prude, and she wanted a school for all of them. The prudent thing would have been to start with kindergarten and maybe first grade. That's how you build a school with a seed, and then you gradually build it. But since Krista had a need, and she said, I'll come up and I'll help you. So she came, and we started a school that incorporated you know, a preschool program from four to fifth grade, 10 years old. My husband, Blair, had just inherited some money. So he used that money to buy a house for the school. And it was on the corner of Ridge Road, right across from Nevada Union High School, and Via Vista, right on that corner. We thought it would be a perfect site for a school. And we were asking for a use permit from the county for 50 children to start with. It was going to be. And so Chris and I came, came back, and we started um, trying to get people in spreading the word that this new school was happening. And it was really hard in the beginning yeah. because people had no idea what we were talking about. So we'd have meetings and inviting the community, trying to express the value of a Waldorf education. And then this group of parents uh, came together and they got very excited about preparing classrooms for the children. They made handmade desks, beautiful wooden desks, for the children. Um, in the, for the first, we had a first and second grade combined, and then a th third and fourth and a fifth. And we also had a kindergarten. Blackboards, beautiful slate blackboards with beautiful trim, wooden trim. So, and painted the whole house. It was all devoted to the school. We had a kindergarten classroom. And this you must have been, let's see, this would have been 79. Yeah. 79. We opened, but the use permit hadn't come through in time because we'd been so excited about getting the school ready. We hadn't thought about right. several things, and this is, was such a learning experience. The first thing was that we didn't think about the community we were coming into. Did we, we didn't go to the neighbors and tell them about this beautiful thing we were about to do and how it wouldn't be much more of an impact than the I think it was almost 2,000 kids going to NU at that time. It was a huge number of traffic and all. We weren't going to be increasing that much so that they would even notice. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't tell them you know, just about the beauty of the education and try to, we ignored the space. We ignored these neighbors who, of course, were concerned when they found out, especially one neighbor who came over the summer, and she was a, her husband was the county council for Nevada City, big powerful guy. And when she, they heard they were going to be on Via Vista right across from the street, and school opened, and these cars came in, and they, what is going on? They didn't even know. We hadn't even told them. So they immediately, she went around with a petition saying, today, uh, a school, tomorrow a gas station. Basically, she misread, misrepresented that we were just asking for a use permit in a residential area, which is what all schools are. They're in residential areas. It was never, could never be a gas station or anything commercial. Mm -hmm. But she misrepresented it, and she got the neighbors all to sign it. She went around, and so it was very hard to buck that. When I went back and tried to talk to these neighbors, their mind was already made up. This was not okay. So we started without the use permit because we just so were so yeah. sure that this wonderful thing would be welcomed. And we were slapped down with a, we were red flagged, and we had to close after being open only one or two weeks after all that work. <laughs> so, but we were not deterred. We decided to go underground. I don't know if this should be. <laughs> we parents opened their house. We had three different locations. One parent um, took the the upper grade. I guess it was the fifth grade. Another person took maybe it was fourth, fifth. Another person took second, third, and then we had the first grade in the kindergarten. So and the kindergarten was over in Lake Vera. So the school was broken right. in terms of space. And it was very hard that first year because it was, we couldn't really communicate and, and develop a sense of student body mm -hmm. and parent body. 
um, also we through Krista, I'd she had um, uh, links to people who had been trained in Waldorf education. Mm -hmm. So we hired a man who was from Germany, and his name was Andrew Janchek, and he had a very strict, old-fashioned manner with the kids. Mm -hmm. And but you know he was certified Waldorf, so we hired him, and then we hired um, somebody else who had gone to Emerson College in England, which is a Waldorf school. And then we had Beatrice Janchek did the kindergarten. So we had, you know, a staff of trained Waldorf teachers. Well, as it turned out, that first year, difficult not only because of our space such considerations, but that the teachers were trying to push a very strong doctrine. And the parents were resisting because it just didn't feel, it didn't feel um, right for these kids in this time. This was now, you know, it's not 1925, it's many years. So by the end of the year, there was a division and the parents and I have to say, you know, kind of say, well, this is not what we had in mind in terms of Nevada County and these children. We wanted something more free and, and able to, where the, the teachers could be more creative, would be more creative. Mm -hmm. And so all the, um, Krista represented the more traditional Waldorf. And so we found a place, we had to give all of our desks away. It was a nonprofit. So we gave, gave them to another school. Mm -hmm. And so the parents, of a group of six parents and myself, decided we would meet and not to open a school until we really knew what was right. right. What we were, so we met for a whole year, twice a month, and we would start in a, in a group meditating with the question, what is right for these children at this time and this place as far as their education? What is, and just open, mm -hmm. starting from scratch. And we'd all loved the Waldorf curriculum, but we weren't wedded to it. Mm -hmm. And we called ourselves, we finally got incorporated. It was called the New School Association. What was the original school called? The original, thank you. It was called Parsival. That refers to a mythic knight. Parsival was part of the round table. Mm -hmm. And he was the fellow who went after the search for the Holy Grail. So it had a, a sense of searching for the true self, which felt just really right, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. and, and that was actually suggested by Rene Carrito. And so that's a myth that the kids in the Waldorf schools uh, often study in the seventh and eighth grade. So the New School Association group made up of seven adults would meet until we, basically from talking and just allowing our own to intuition to take hold. We, we realized that we loved the curriculum of Waldorf education, but we didn't want to hire Waldorf trained teachers. We wanted to hire really good teachers who were open and loved the creative arts and would be willing to be familiarized with the curriculum of a Waldorf school, but not wedded to it. So we hired uh, Carol Nimick, uh, Emily Whiteside, Susan Hubert, who had been one of the people, she didn't even have children, but in those early days, she was one of the, the, the people on the ground making the desks and all of that for us, she and her husband. And she just really valued, she right away felt a connection mm -hmm. with the, the school. So she taught in the kindergarten. I, I think you had her yeah. eventually. Yeah. Oh, and Marilyn Stahl, thank you. Oh. So Marilyn Stahl, so, so Carol was hired for first grade, and then Marilyn was uh, second, third, mm -hmm. and we decided to start small. And then Susan was in the kindergarten. Emily Whiteside was in the office mm -hmm. to start with, and she had just finished getting her degree in um, sand play therapy, right. Jungian th sand play therapy. So she also really supported the inner workings mm -hmm. of people and the imagination and dreams and letting that all come out. So we had a wonderful group of really pioneers kind of in this, with that open mind. Um, 
And the thing I didn't mention was, the question was, where can we do this school? Right. It's got to be up to code. Right. It's, you can't just go into somebody's house and do a school like we had done. It really has to be up and up, uh, especially if you're going to publicize it. And you know, so I went all over the, all over Nevada City, Grass Valley, spending many hours, going as much as you know, trying to find a place, and found finally found this old, I guess was once a gas station, was it? It was commercial piece of property. Um, in Cedar Ridge mm -hmm. with lots of forested trees. Mm -hmm. And so again, the group of parents worked together to put together um, for the school opening, put together the desks and the blackboards and all that. We had to start again. And so it's the school actually opened, um, let's see, Emily was in 81. That was the first the fall of 81. And Carol Nimick was in the first grade. My daughter, Emily, was in the first grade with her. These teachers, being as gifted as they were, could see immediately that the curriculum of the Waldorf schools was so rich, and they felt themselves growing from working with this kind of curriculum. I mean, it, was, it asked the teachers to create the curriculum. It's not a, you know, a box of books that you get and pass out. No, the teacher has to, to create a story um, and live in the story. And, imagine the pictures that go with the story, then that, that joy and that, uh, the joy of the story is passed to the children. Mm -hmm. So everything, in the, one of the unique things about the Waller Schools in which these teachers incorporated was that, to try to teach through story mm -hmm. as much as possible, to teach academics through stories. For instance, if you're teaching about addition in first grade, you could tell a story about the greedy king who wanted this and this and this and this. A fairy tale of some kind. And then in the, the uh, generous king who gave away, subtraction, you know, and how you divide the land, that's division. So um, the children would listen to the story. They'd have a um, picture that this teacher had drawn on the blackboard that related to the story. And this would be drawn in beautiful pieces of chalk. Mm -hmm. This is another tradition of the Waldorf education, is to draw a beautiful picture. The children made their own books. You didn't have any pre-made books in the classroom. The children made, they had big pieces of paper like this and made, they drew their version of whatever the teacher was drawing. Now you might say that's, at the beginning I thought that was a bit weird, that you had to copy the teacher. Mm -hmm. But it's never copying because every person has their own unique version of that. And it's a model that the children could start with when they're learning to, to draw mm -hmm. um, and later be more independent. Mm -hmm. But that kind of, Steiner believed that the teacher should model mm -hmm. c the correct, not only um, expression of a, of a piece of art, but the correct behavior and everything. Children learn by imitating. Right. And then they can be, be independent later. The people who were members of that New School Association were Lorraine Webb, Mary Ann, and Larry Gramlich, who had come right from the beginning uh, at Parsifal. Um, so they met with us. And then Susan Vasick, who was part of my nursery school she staff and she joined us she didn't have any, any children who were part of it in the beginning but eventually she did oh and marty nathans who whose husband is buzz grouch who started um, new moon restaurant oh my gosh yeah and their child went there elias, yeah, elias. so those were the group that was the group hmm. yeah well, one of the things that was so wonderful about the school were the parents, because soon, as the, the children came with their parents, we had this whole body of support. And these parents, many of them could not afford to come to, to pay for their children, so, but they would pay as much as they could. Um, so we had as much, our, our, one of our founding tenants was that children who needed this kind of education, and of course 
I now believe everybody needs it. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, there were kids who really needed to have to enrich the academics with um, the arts. And so we wanted anyone who could, who needed, sorry. That's fine. we wanted anyone who needed this kind of education to be able to come yeah. Yeah. free. But we had to pay the bills and pay the teachers and all, so it was hard. And parents contributed. We had a lot of parents, you know, single parents uh, who Basically, their budget was food, shelter, and school. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was one of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so people would come out. I think it was 250 a, a month. I can't remember yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but one of our just really blessings was the Jacobsons, who actually Blair had known uh, in high school, Dale, oh, really? and they were, you know. Schoolmates. Schooling, yeah, yeah. schoolmates. And um, we met them just when we were starting the school and told them about it. And at that point, Anya was just be, had just been born and you were a toddler. And you weren't old enough to be part of the school, but as soon as you were, you were right there. Yeah, well, we were there because Heather was going to Gloria Kirshner's. Uh -huh. the, um, the, yeah, on Ridge Road, on Ridge, it was the... Um, Wasn't it called Rainbow Bridge? Preschool? Rainbow Ridge. Ridge. Right, that's where David went. Yeah, the Quaker School. So she was going to that with, with Gloria, and so she was just getting be ready to be through with that, and so you told Susan to meet with us. And so Susan met with Dale and I and Heather, oh. and I remember we walked around a pond, and she told us about the Waldorf, and Dale goes, well, we might as well. I mean, we don't have a better place, and Heather was finishing up with Gloria, so we became part of that kindergarten. So then, of course, we invited all our friends <laughs> oh. to meet. And so that made a nice, healthy beginning class. Oh, wonderful. It. I know. Yo. But when we moved there, when we started, it was, a, it was literally a gas station garage. And it was greasy, filthy, dirty. I mean, we had to take down walls and build up new things and scrub and paint. and A floor, the linoleum was all full of and, and, um, junk. Cement mm -hmm. floors with oil. It was, we yeah. built a playground that summer. We built a school yeah, that summer. A lot Everybody of them. contributed. Right. It was very, right. it was very sweet. Uh -huh. yeah. I was going to say about how the teachers became so enamored with the Waldorf curriculum um, that they were... Um, they were, what's the word, they were lobbying to change it to, instead of Mariposa, oh, we called it Mariposa School at now, Mariposa I forgot Country to mention, school. Mariposa Country School, because Mariposa is the, trans represents, is butterfly in Spanish, and the butterfly represents the uh, transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So we wanted all of the children to spread their wings and be who, you know, to actualize who they really were. The parents and some of the board members and the teachers wanted to use Waldorf in the name. So they wanted to change the name to Mariposa Waldorf School. And I was really afraid of that happening because I didn't want that the, the dogma of what I had experienced as Waldorf, you know, the rules and all to to, to um, impact the kind of create the creativeness that I felt the school embodied at that point, you know, because people were using that as a touchstone, but actually inventing their own ways, and so there was a big um, uh, there was some tension there between those who wanted to keep it. With it called country school, and those who wanted to change the wall. And the, none the, those people mostly had no idea what had happened with Parsifal. So they didn't understand the kind of care that the, the seven of us had put into not wanting to have any kind of rigid philosophy. Mm. And we were so afraid of that. But eventually, that group won out, and it became, the name was changed to Mariposa Waller School. And I was on the board during that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was part of that change. Yeah. <laughs> and we did not know the history, of course, as deeply as, I mean, even now I'm learning mm -hmm. more from you. But part of it was, came from, um, well, he was Rumi, Gabriel Ross, Rumi Ross Gabriel now. And 
from the Live Oak Waldorf School and from Steiner and from Renee coming and Nancy Poehler. And they were saying, this is who you are. This is what you're teaching. So let's have the school reflect. This is the main premise of what we're teaching. And so that's why we all voted that way. I know. <laughs> and so it I'm turned out luckily, blessedly so. But yeah, it all know. worked out and people were still... And people didn't stay rigid. Right. They that's the thing. That they kept that fluidity and the flexibility right. and the openness. Right. So that says something about those teachers. They had the, the right kind of character to, that we were looking for in the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. Our intention was so strong mm -hmm. and we were really serving the children. That was the idea that we're here for the children and not for any notions of what should be imposed on those children. But what is it? Well, in growing up, we didn't have much money, but my parents always said, if you want lessons, doesn't matter what it is, we'll pay for it if you work. Mm -hmm. So I started out with dance lessons when I was four and eventually started piano lessons. I had art lessons. Um, I sang in the, in the elementary school choir. And in those days, we had an elementary school string orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, Where were you raised? In Riverside, California, yeah. yeah. So that was the most, as I look back on my early life, that was what was, had most meaning for me. And that's where I really felt alive, was within the arts. So that's why it was so important when I started working with children that that be included. I went to Pomona College. Yeah. yeah. I went to Pomona College where I majored in child development and music. And then I went to Harvard University where I got a master's in education. And that's where I got my teaching credential. Oh, yes. And that little girl who inspired the whole movement to, to find a school uh, initially, um, my daughter Emily is now a Waldorf teacher, uh, and she works in the, um, it's called the Waldorf School of Atlanta, and she's been there, and now she's taken a whole class through from first to eighth grade, and then now she's on her second class. After raising her children for four years, she took a break, and now she's, the kids are now in the third, finished third grade. So she loves it and she just thrives. I mean, it is one of the best kinds of work that a person can do is, I think, live in that, with that kind of curriculum. It's so, it's just, a, it's hardly work, you know? It's really, uh, you grow from it so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she loves it, her children love it. They're both Waller students. Well, the question that I've been holding for most of my life is why are we, as humans, here? What is our purpose? And, and I feel that the purpose is to serve others and also to find out who we are. In order to know who we are, we have to be in contact with our inner, our inner selves um, and the strength that we all hold. And Waldorf education, that model, is so attuned to the way children grow and develop. It's, it's, it's different than the, the industrial kind of model where we feed, feed the kid uh, you know, this stuff and then they blurt it out. And they, but they don't know who they are. They don't know what. It's foreign, really. So Waldorf education ask of each child, show us yourself, you know, tune into the, the, the stories, live those stories, take them into your life. What does it mean to be a greedy king? You know, um, how can we care for each other, you know, with, by giving? Um, so I love the fact that 
the stories are so important. Mm -hmm. And even when you get into the upper grades, the eighth grade, seventh grade, you don't just learn science, you learn about the people that made the discoveries. You learn the biography of Madame Curie. Mm -hmm. You learn uh, what the process was of discovery and where you live with those people. Um, identify with those people. And then it, it becomes something real for you as a, as a person. So the idea, for instance, the contrast is of starting in our normal kind of education. Reading as a skill is, there's so much emphasis put on that, more and more so in the kindergartens, in our public schools. You have to read in kindergarten. Well, is that appropriate? I mean, one of the reasons they have that kind of regimen is it's easier to control a class if everyone is doing, looking on a board and, you know, this, this word is bat, and everyone goes bat, you know, just out of nowhere. You know, it doesn't relate to anything else. Um, but to do that too early, some children are not ready for that. In fact, Steiner and uh, believe that children will learn to read unless there's some, you know, uh, damage or some, some way that it makes it hard to, th to think, and they need special help. And of course, those children should be addressed. But other than that, a natural, children will learn to read the way they learn to talk. Hmm. You learn to talk sometimes later than others, but that's your natural, you naturally learn to talk. Same way with reading. So reading isn't such a big deal. Instead, you want the children to sing and dance and enjoy themselves with others. The greatest joy I found in Waldorf is that ability to appreciate and respect other cultures and other people. Cultures from all the way from our earth, like it was the first time I'd ever heard about composting. Nobody had ever told me about composting. And it was just like, we're pausing to give back to the earth who mm. has given to us. And just this incredible respect of seasons, incredible respect of rhythm of life mm -hmm. um, from birth to death and, and the whole cycle. And it was just, it was so beautiful to have that and to have all the natural um, play toys and mm -hmm. materials for the children of wool and silk and cotton and um, that they didn't have plastic in the room and they there was they would set a table before they ate and everyone had to everyone waited for the other person before and it was just such a incredible respect and I just see that carried on um, and our children's appreciation of other cultures and traveling adventures their acceptance and respect and love mm. of the world the universe. I mean, yeah. really, it's a, it goes way beyond just our, our little community. It, it, we respect all the cycles, mm -hmm. all the rhythms. Mm. And that was huge. I never had that in my uh -huh. life. Uh -huh. And that was huh. such a, yeah, just such a, a gratitude for that yeah. part of the education. Yeah. yeah. And as a result, we've traveled many places in the world, Dale and I, that we probably never would have because our children said, <gasps> Come here. Uh -huh. We have to go here and check yeah. this out. Yeah. Because their their enthusiasm for education and for learning is mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Another point that that a strand that goes all through Waldorf education is that the head, the heart, and the hands are all equally important. It's not isn't just about filling your heads with facts, but your hands. What they can do is so valuable. And so crafts from the kindergarten, well, even, yeah, from kindergarten all up, the children are making things. Mm -hmm. And oh, everyone learns to knit in the first grade. Everyone learns to do needlepoint at some point. They actually end up having woodworking classes. You know, so, and my daughter, for her, that was the most, where she really shined and really was actually depressed if she didn't have a project that she could work on. And when she couldn't go to Waldorf schools because the school folded at some point, her grade folded, and we had to go outside of town to have a Waldorf education. That was fourth grade. And then she went into the public school, and it was a real, she would just 
yearn mm. for projects. Mm. And so she started making her projects. And in high school, this isn't, she started making pillows, handmade pillows, embroidering them and giving them to her friends. And they loved them. I mean, they didn't have any handmade thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the boys started saying, can you make me a pillow? <laughs> and she had all these orders for pillows that she so much that she could hardly do her work. Mm -hmm. But it was that crying from mm -hmm. others that, yes, something that's handmade. It was not easy to have a private school because not everyone could afford it. But people did their best and gave what they could. Teachers actually reduce their salaries somewhat. Um, everyone was doing their best to make it happen. But there were some years that it was, a, it was just a real struggle. And that we had a, it be, was private for 14 years. And somehow, some way, we eventually got through um, with enough money coming in that the, to maintain the school, but it was not easy. And so when Carol Nimick uh, heard about the charter school movement, she had the idea that let's make Mariposa a charter school. And she, put, she was the one that wrote the grant and had the vision that it be a public school. And it was just such a celebration in my heart because that's the kind of, I wanted, every child to be able to have this education without having to pay for it. It should be their right, if possible. So I'm so happy that Yuba River now exists and it's there for the community. Um, it was the first Waldorf charter in the country. Um, and now they're, they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's wonderful, this movement, to have expanded in this way. We asked that every parent contribute whatever they could, uh, not only financially, but also in various kinds of w work they could do for the school, be it cleanup or coming into the classroom and helping. There were various ways we tried to involve the parents. And uh, they were very enthusiastic. As much as they could, they, they came and uh, contributed, mm -hmm. honoring the natural passing of the seasons. Mm -hmm. Those festivals are, I mean, it's just so wonderful because we don't have a culture that is celebrating festivals in that way. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a greeting card, you know, Hallmark kind of festival instead of really uh, grounded in a very old ancient tradition. Right. I am dismayed by how much screens have taken over our lives and how much children are tr attracted to the TV and the cell phones and the iPhones. And, and instead of having a real direct contact with the world and in, with nature, you know, they, the, there's this screen in front of, in front of the person. And I'm, I'm very concerned it is really changing the human brain mm -hmm. because uh, the memory isn't what it used to be because we can go and Google anything. Waldorf uh, curriculum really requires children to memorize. They have to know the stories. They, they take those home and uh, it's every, every story is, lasts for a week or two in the classroom. The children live those stories. So the, the mind is, is, has that capacity. And it's not dulled by something artificial. It is very hard to Discipline, when it's all around in your culture, discipline your children not to have so much screen time. Mm -hmm. But I know in my daughter's family, the children have never, I don't think they've seen a movie. Mm -hmm. um, they do watch baseball. Their mother, you know, this year, this year, they're at 10 and 8. They get to watch baseball uh, because they love baseball. They don't watch any shows mm -hmm. on television. And they are so alive. I mean, you know, you know from your own children who are part of Waldorf schools, it's just, uh, it's like a different, it's a true human beings 
are, are, are flowering instead of being suppressed by something, well, Rudolf Steiner called it Araman. Do you ever know about this? Mm -hmm. he, he predicted that at the turn of the century, 20, and this is like 1924, he said at the turn of the 20th century, there are going to be what he called dark forces mm. coming into the world. And it's going to be very hard to fight and keep the light going. Mm -hmm. um, and I interpret that as basically, uh, well, we see that in our world today. Yeah, what's happening now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all, and what do you do in the face of that? Mm -hmm. You do your best, and the Waldorf School is an option for people. It's just remarkable and wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited about the new school mm -hmm. that is you know, happening in Grass Valley. It's just, this is, this is the year, uh, 2018, the opening of this Yuba River Charter with his own building and own grounds and own gardens. Who knows how many years this will flourish now with everyone's support mm -hmm. and enthusiasm. Yeah.